saying good morning. It's good to see so many people here. I want to welcome our visitors. We are glad that you've chosen to be with us and those who might have found our YouTube channel, Courthouse Church of Christ, and are tuning in on our live stream. Uh, we are happy to have you with us this morning as well. This morning, I want to talk to you about a lesson I've entitled Washed. From 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, you can begin turning there if you'd like. We're going to start there this morning in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Uh, Brother Benjamin's gospel meeting this past week was on how to stop worrying and start living. And I had something else uh, in mind that I've been working on. And as, I, as we finished up that gospel meeting, I couldn't help but think of uh, one of a kind of a follow-up to that. And how to stop worrying and to start living is to talk about how to be washed, how to uh, wash away sin so that we can be worry and stress-free in that regard, and how to live our lives in such a way to reflect Christ in our lives. <clears throat> but it was an interesting thing that sparked this thought, so bear with me as, we, as I walk you through that. 2020, three years ago, 2020 has been since called the dumpster fire year, uh, there are so many lessons we learned. You notice the first zero there is the coronavirus. That kind of summarizes 2020 and really the, 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 new, nor the new normal that we've been living under for the last three years. There are some lessons that we learned. One is that a pandemic can very well shut the world down. Uh, through government overreach, we learned our constitutional rights are not as unalienable as we once thought. Fallout from that is still playing out through the courts today. Some people are willing to give up their rights in the name of safety and the greater good, and we're totally fine with it. Misinformation can come from anywhere. These were lessons that we learned. One of the things we learned, and probably one of the harshest things that we learned, was that masks can divide the country, families, and churches. I was heartbroken from 2020 to 21 to learn of preachers who were fired over the mass situation for and against. Churches were divided and split in two over whether they should wear masks or not wear masks. We learned the lesson that we all stood too close to each other prior to 2020, and there had to be a six-foot distance. Remember that? We also learned that we all touch our faces way too often. We were told to stop it. We learned that none of us knew how to wash our hands properly. <laughs> or for how long. And hand washing became one of the most important preventative measures we were told to take against COVID-19. I don't know if you're aware of this, but prior to that, uh, before COVID-19, most hand washing posters had five to seven steps. During and after COVID, if you look up a hand washing poster, you find 12 to 13 steps. This one shows 13 steps. And so I want you to, to, to walk it through with me if you can read it. We were told that we were all washing our hands wrong. That for 20 to 40 seconds, we're supposed to sing slowly the happy birthday song. Insert whatever name you can. The longer name, the, pot, the better. And we're start when it running to water with our hands like this. Get soap. And then each palm. And then interlace your fingers, both sides. And then cup them. And then you're supposed to run your thumbs. And then you're supposed to do this in your palms. And then your wrists. And then run underwater again, even your elbows. Because remember what we were doing? We were washing our hands, but we were elbow bumping. Remember, we were chicken winging everyone. No handshakes. We were chicken winging. So make sure to wash those elbows. And then back to drying and done. 13 steps. I know I learned a lot from this poster. <laughs> I was washing my hands all wrong all this time. And for way too short a time. I ran it just enough to get the soap off. And I was done. 2020 taught us that was wrong. Tons of videos were made to show us the proper way to wash our hands. TikTok, Facebook, Instagram were filled with videos on how to wash your hands. Washing your hands may wash them clean for a moment. But as we all know, how long between washing your hands till you touch something? And they're already dirty again. Washing your hands never fully removes the germs. To truly be stress-free and to worry less, God prescribes a way to be clean from sin, way less complicated than the hand-washing charts that came about during and after COVID-19. In a few simple steps, you can be washed. Jesus says, we're going to look at the words of Jesus later. 
In answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? Jesus says to hear the gospel, believe in him, believe in Jesus, repent of sins, confess him, confess Christ, be baptized, and to remain faithful. In just a few simple steps, you can be washed, sanctified, and justified in Jesus Christ. I want us to be turning to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, to see the need to be washed, why we need to be washed. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10 says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. There are some people, due to unrighteousness, who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who don't inherit the kingdom of God will inherit hell. Matthew 25, 41 describes hell as a place of eternal fire. It is the domain, the abode of Satan and his angels. Therefore, it is to inherit Satan's punishment and his eternal prison. That is what it means to not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous are those who commit evil acts. 1 John 3, 4 and 3, 7 to 8 tell us that lawlessness, iniquity is sin. And a few of those sins are named here. This is not an all-inclusive list. This gives a partial sampling. And what we're going to find out is these are the types of people that Paul encountered in the city of Corinth when he arrived. And so he's going to tell us sins involving the abuse or misuse of the body, sexual immorality. Paul encountered people of such immorality and sin that it, it was, it's staggering. And yet we find a church grew there. Sins involving the abuse or misuse of the body, fornication, that is sex before marriage, adultery, sex with anyone other than one's spouse. And Paul says these things will keep you from heaven. 1 Corinthians 6, 13 and verse 18, he says, flee immorality. The body is not for sexual immorality. Hebrews 13, 5 says the marriage bed is to be held in honor among all because God will judge fornicators and adulterers. He also then talks about homosexuality and those who are effeminate. Same-sex sexual immorality. God has decreed that sexual, homosexual acts and practices are sinful. Romans 1 has a lot to say about it. Romans 1 verse 26 describes it as degrading. New King James says vile, unnatural. New King James says against nature. Romans 1.27 describes it as indecent acts. New King James simply says shameful. And the New American also regards it as error. Romans 1.28 describes it as being not proper. New King James says not fitting. Romans 1 describes same-sex practices as conduct that results from rejecting the Creator. Romans 1.25. This passage in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10 tells us the need to be washed is also from sins involving the abuse or misuse of things. It's idolatry, stealing, robbing and swindling, and covetousness, which is also greed. Colossians 3, 5 tells us saints are to put to death these evil things in their lives and tells us that greed amounts to idolatry. If we covet something, it can become our God. It becomes idolatry, and therefore it is sinful. This passage also tells us the sins of lack of self-control, drunkenness. 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5 tells us saints are not to engage in such behavior. And he mentions drunkenness, carousing, that is late night drinking in the streets, and drinking parties. So he slams drink, getting drunk in, in public and in private and in social gatherings. Peter says that belonged to the life of the Gentiles. That belonged to your life before Christ. That is not to be named among Christians. Then he also talks about revilers. Revilers are those who use verbal abuse. It's also used in conjunction with blasphemy against God. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20, this word is used as outbursts of anger. And it is listed as a deed of the flesh, something that does not belong in the life of a Christian. This is describing the sinful world around us, both then and now. The world has been deceived. 
And they teach these things are not only acceptable, but should be practiced with impunity. Romans chapter 2, 6 to 9 tells us the unrighteous will be punished. Paul says these things will keep you out of heaven. And Matthew 25, 41 tells us the alternative to heaven is the devil's prison, the devil's punishment, and it is a place of eternal fire. Matthew 25, verse 41. Just as the coronavirus was a cause to wash our hands, sin is a cause for washing our hearts. Because unlike the temporary nature of washing your hands or not washing your hands, sin carries an eternal penalty. And so we must be cleansed from sin. And we can be washed. We can be made clean. The world teaches that many of these practices that we can read of in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, are inherent. That means you're born with it and cannot be changed from. The obvious sin that is taught as genetic is homosexuality. But also some teach people are born with genetic tendencies towards an adultery. Just They have it in their genes. They can't be faithful. They have it in their genes. They can't do anything but be a drunk. All of that is false. It can be fought against, and you can change your life. Some say that some are even teaching, some scientists are out there saying that now genetics proves that you have anger issues, that you're prone to drunkenness and addictions of all kinds. And while there are some things that happen with that, from diseases that are passed on from the parent, as you get older, it can be fought against. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but you have to ask yourself when you're in that situation, do I want to spend an eternity in hell or do I want to fight my demons now? I want to fight those addictions now. You can be washed. I want us to note 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11. Paul's describing in that list in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, he's describing the people that made up the church in Corinth. Their former backgrounds. Notice what he says. Such were some of you. But there was a change. Something happened where they changed from homosexual. They changed from a drunken they, or from a drunk. They changed from a thief. They changed from a swindler. They changed from a reviler, a blasphemer. What happened? Such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the spirit of our God, he says, both Jesus, the Holy Spirit and God, the father are there as part of that washing, sanctification and justification. He's saying some of the Corinthian brethren. So when we go back to first Corinthians one, one, and we see him say to the church of God that is in Corinth, he's saying these people came from these horrible backgrounds. They used to look and feel and smell just like the world. But a change occurred. And no longer. They're different. They're inheriting the kingdom of heaven. If the brethren in Corinth can come out of these backgrounds and be washed, sanctified, and justified, brethren, we know that we can come out of these things too. We can change our lifestyles. He says the Corinthians had been washed. If we go back to Acts 18... So where Paul first comes into contact with the, the brethren there at Corinth, or who would become the brethren in Corinth. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 18. Paul enters into Corinth. And if we look in verse 8, it says, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. They heard the gospel and they were baptized. Romans, or I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, reading from the New King James, tells us the blood of Christ washes away our sins. Acts 22, verse 16, Ananias told Saul of Tarsus, Why do you delay? Arise, be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, and wash away your sins. When we are baptized, our sins are washed away. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Paul talks about the Ephesian saints. He says that they are washed of water with the word. This, this is the way for Jesus to present the church to the Father as having no spot or wrinkle, being holy and blameless. The Ephesians were washed. The Corinthians were washed. He says the Corinthians being washed, then were sanctified. Corinthians 1-2, we read they were sanctified and called saints. 
Both the word saint and sanctified are related to the word holy. That means set apart, holy to God, no longer unrighteous, but righteous. And so as sanctified, as saints, they're set apart for the use of God, not their own selfish desires, certainly not good as defined by the world. The Corinthians being washed and sanctified were justified. Justification is the act of being pardoned. To be justified means being freed from guilt. In this case, the guilt of sin, that is unrighteousness. Through baptism, we are justified. Romans 3.24 and Titus 3.7 says, justified freely by his grace. Romans 5.1, Galatians 2.16 tell us, we are justified by faith. And Romans 5, 9 says we are justified by his blood. So when we are washed from our sins, being washed in the blood of the lamb, that's how we become justified. We become washed. We become sanctified, set apart from the world to God for his good use and justified, pardoned, freed from our sin. Ephesians 1, 7 tells us we are in his blood. We are freed from sin. We have redemption. Romans 5.9 says, being washed in his blood justifies us and saves us from his wrath. Romans 8.33 says, God justifies. On that day of judgment, those who are found righteous will stand justified. Obedience to the gospel washes, sanctifies, and justifies. We must know that we can change from unrighteous lives to righteous lives for God, that we can be washed and be made clean. But then just as that chart tells us that we were all washing our hands improperly and tells us the right way to do it, there are people in this world that understand the need to be washed, but they go about it the wrong way. And so we look to the scriptures to find how to wash And the words of Jesus himself tell us we are to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and obey or be faithful. In Matthew 28, 18 to 20, I want you to turn back there. Uh, Brother Trey read this for us in our scripture reading. I want to thank him for doing that. And I say you turn back with me to Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus says, go and teach. Make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Mark 16, 15 to 16, Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, as Jesus says there in Matthew 28, would entail what he says to them in Matthew, or I'm sorry, Mark 16, 15 to 16. Here it says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. We look in John 5, 24, and he mentions that they are to hear. We read John 3, 16, 18, that people must believe. Luke 13, 3 through 5, he says you need to repent or you will die in your sins. He says, Matthew 10, 32, you are to confess. He says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before the Father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. He says to be baptized, as we just read in Mark 16, verse 16. In John 8, 31, he talks about continued faithfulness, obedience. If you continue in my word, you show yourselves to be true disciples. So Jesus talks about the steps of how to wash, to hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithfully. He says abide or continue in his word. That is to be obedient to the word. He says in John 14, 15, you are my friends if you do as I command you. So the question is, did others follow that pattern? Did others follow that pattern? I'm going to run through these examples fairly fast. Uh, for those that want more, the, the, there is a chart in the back. And 
on the website, you can, not only is this outline on the website already, but you can look for, if you go to our website and do a search under the sermon area, you can search for examples of conversion and find a deeper lesson on all of these examples we're going to look at. I'm, in, I'm providing them just to show a pattern of people following what Jesus said. The first example we find is the Jews on Pentecost in Acts 2, 14 through 41, that they heard, they believed, they repented. Confession isn't recorded there, but they, ba they were baptized, Acts 2, 38 and verse 41. They were in accordance with, Matt, with Mark 16, 16. They believed, Acts 2, 37, and they were baptized, Acts 2, 41. The Samaritans in Acts 8, 5 to 14. They heard Acts 8, 6, they believed Acts 8, 12, and they were baptized Acts 8, verse 12. It says multitudes of men and women. They were in obedient to Jesus' words in Mark 16, 16. They believed and were baptized, Mark or Acts 8 and verse 12. Simon, he also was in Samaria, the former sorcerer. We sometimes do him a disservice by saying Simon the sorcerer. He had given up that lifestyle because he heard in Acts 8, 6. He believed in Acts 8, 13. <clears throat> he repented in Acts 8, 9, and he was baptized in Acts 8, 13. And so he himself became a Christian in obedience with the words of Jesus. And the Ethiopian eunuch on his way back from Jerusalem as a Jewish proselyte, on his way back to Ethiopia as Queen Candace's treasurer in Acts 8, 26 to 39. He heard Acts 8, 34 to 35. He believed Acts 8, 37. His repentance is not recorded, but we know it is a requirement to be baptized. He confessed Jesus as the Son of God in Acts 8, 37. In Acts 8, 38, Philip went down into the water with him, and it came up out of the water. The necessary inference being he was baptized fully immersed. Was he in accordance with Jesus' teachings? Yes, he believed, and he was baptized. The apostle Saul or the Apostle Paul, who started out as Saul of Tarsus. In Acts 8, 9, 1 to 18, Acts 22, 10 to 16, Acts 26, 2 to 21, Galatians 1, 23, and 1 Timothy 1, 13. Paul, in all of these passages, says he followed all five of these steps. In Acts 22, 10 and verse 15, he says he heard the words of Jesus. He believed, Acts 9, 11, Galatians 1, 23, 1 Timothy 1, 13, he repented. In Acts 22.10, he confessed, Lord, he called Jesus Kurios, that is supreme authority. And he was baptized, Acts 22.16 and 9 and verse 18. Where Ananias said to him, why do you delay, arise, be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of Jesus. We find in Acts 9.18, after Ananias came to him, it says, immediately he was baptized. He followed the words of Jesus. He believed and was baptized. And we read of Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. He was in the Roman centurion in Acts 10, 1 to 48. He heard the words that Peter came in Acts 10, 33. He believed them, Acts 10, 43. Uh, repentance and confession are not recorded there, but they are a prerequisite to baptism. So we know that they happened. Acts 10, 48, he and his household were baptized. They believed and were baptized. And the next one, Sergius Paulos. He is the highest ranking official in the New Testament that is recorded having become a believer. He summoned Paul and Barnabas to him, wanting to hear the gospel, so he heard it in Acts 13, 7. He believed it, Acts 13, 12. And he's, re he's called a believer, or he believed. <clears throat> While the next steps are not recorded for us, we do know in Acts 5 and verse 14, when it refers to believers, it was believers who had believed and were baptized. And so he is listed among believers, meaning he followed those steps. And Lydia, Acts 16, 13 to 15. She heard Acts 16, 14. She believed Acts 16, 15. Her repentance and confession are not recorded, but she is baptized in verse 15 in accordance with the teachings of Jesus. The Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 25 to 34. He heard Acts 16, 30. He believed, Acts 16, 34. He repented and was baptized in Acts 16 and verse 33. He followed the words of Jesus. And the Corinthians, as we just talked about in Acts 18, 8, they heard, they believed, and were baptized in Acts 18, 8. The Galatians, Galatians 3, 26 to 27, 
They believed and were baptized, Acts 3, 26 through 27. They were in accordance with the words of Jesus to believe and be baptized. The Ephesians, Paul runs into them in Acts 19, 4 to 5. They heard in Acts 19, 5. They believed, Acts 19, 4, and were baptized, Acts 19, 5. And the final example is the Colossians. We can look at the saints at Colossae, Colossians 1, 5 to 10, 2 and verse 11 through 12. They heard, Colossians 1, 5 to 6. They believed, Colossians 1, 4 and 2, verse 12. And their baptism was mentioned in Colossians 2 and verse 12. We see that others throughout the New Testament followed the pattern that Jesus laid out and the teachings of the apostles as they went into all the world, teaching men and women to observe all the commands that Jesus taught, that they would teach them to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In all these cases, we can see the commission of Jesus to go and teach in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, being fulfilled with the result of men and women believing and being baptized, and in many of these cases with urgency, where it says immediately or directly following, there was an urgency to the message. They wanted to go from unclean to clean, from unrighteous to righteous. We like the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, we must know some things. We need to know that one can inherit the kingdom of God. Colossians 1.13, in speaking to the saints at Colossae, he says they were transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of marvelous light. One cannot inherit the kingdom of God while enslaved to sin. And Paul gives just a sampling of the sins that he's, he ran into at Corinth that were the backgrounds of some of the members there. And he says these practices will keep you out of heaven. Romans 6, 16 and 20 and verse 23 all says that as he talks to the Roman saints, he says they were no longer slaves to sin, but they became, from obedience of the heart, they became slaves to God. No longer slaves of unrighteousness, slaves to righteousness. And in verse 23, he mentions they now possess the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. One of the things he says we need to know in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, is that one can change, one can be washed, sanctified, and justified through the blood of Jesus in obedience to the gospel. Romans chapter 6, 17 to 18, and Romans 6, 22 to 23, that gift, that free gift of Jesus is eternal life. But he does tell us the wages of sin is death. The alternative to that wages of sin being death, again, Matthew 25, 41, that eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, is that free gift of life in Jesus. But we have to choose. Practice those things that of unrighteousness that will keep us out of heaven, or change, be washed, sanctified, and justified, that we might have that eternal life. People can improperly wash their hands, in essence, just get their hands wet. That's what COVID was teaching us. There's an improper method to washing hands. Well, the important lesson there, as we use that analogy, is people can improperly try to wash their sins away, such as just saying a prayer, though it's nowhere commanded by God, Jesus, or the apostles. By being baptized by any method other than full immersion, by sprinkling or pouring, or getting baptized as an infant. Some say, I was baptized as, as an infant, and so therefore I must be saved. Can an infant hear and believe? No. The prerequisite for baptism is to hear and believe and to repent of sin. An infant can do neither. Being baptized for any other reason than for the forgiveness of sins. Some out there say, yeah, we, we'll do a baptism and they schedule it. There's no urgency. We'll schedule it and then you will become a member of our denomination. You become a member of our group. Or you are to be baptized. We're going to schedule it so that you can have an outward appearance of an inward grace. Do a word search. It's not in the scriptures. Again, falsely trying to wash one's hands is just as bad as those, and it's even worse for those trying to wash away their sins by man-made means and methods and reasons. We need to follow the commands of Jesus who tells us why we need to be washed and the way to do it. 
with no other source but the scriptures. We can see one must hear and have faith that is believed, so it, counts, it, can't, it discounts infants, and be baptized. And with no other source but the scriptures, we can find no other mode of baptism but full immersion is recorded. All other modes are added by men hundreds of years after the writing of the New Testament. Hundreds of years after the apostles were sent out to teach all the words that Jesus told them and commanded them. So they were added. But people can properly wash their hands. And even washing properly, it only lasts temporarily, right? Till you touch your face again, till you touch some object, till you touch some surface. I'll give you an example. I, I'm a, you, most of you here know I'm allergic to cumin. I can't, I can't even breathe it. I will start hiving up. And it's, it's temporary if I just breathe it in or touch something versus eating it. If I eat it, it, it could kill me. <laughs> or at the, very, at the very least, it takes a week of medicine to get me back to normal. We were at an amusement park once, and we found out that this place we wanted to eat at, my father-in-law really wanted to eat at, uh, we went there for that reason. They serve cumin in everything. And the, the manager said, you need to back away. So we went and ate elsewhere. Well, afterwards, we washed our hands, and we got in line, and we rode a ride. After that ride, I hived up. Somebody had eaten at that world-famous restaurant with cumin and touched the bars, and I touched them right after them, and I hived up, and I was, that, I was suffering for about an hour. Washing our hands cleanses us only temporarily until we touch something else. Jesus himself said, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 16. When one obeys the gospel by being baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and baptized into the name of Jesus, the name, the only name that can save, Acts 4, 10 to 12, they become eternally washed. And it doesn't mean that they're not going to sin again and have need of that repentance and forgiveness. But baptism is a one-time occurrence. Once you are baptized for the forgiveness of sins, you are eternally washed. You still must repent of your sins because we all know we're going to commit sin. We're going to keep going back to that old way of life. We have to fight it. 1 John 1, 9 tells those who have been washed the prescription. Confess your sins to God, and he is faithful and righteous to forgive you. We're told to confess our sins to one another so that we will be forgiven by one another. There's no need to be washed again. This morning, if you haven't been washed, sanctified, and justified, we encourage you, we plead with you, to obey the gospel now, recognizing from 2 Corinthians 6, 2, that now is the day of salvation. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another hour. There is urgency. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised the next hour. If you recognize that today, you are asking the question, what do I need to do to be saved? Follow the words of Jesus to hear the gospel. Believe in Jesus. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus as Christ, the Son of God. Be baptized and remain faithful. Continue in his word as we see there in John 8 and verse 31. You can be repent and be baptized into his name. You can be washed and made free from sin this very moment. And this morning, if you're not living the way that you should as a Christian, remember your washing Remember what you've been rescued from, as Colossians 1.13 says, rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into the domain of light. You may repent so that you may be renewed and be made clean. Whatever your request might be this morning, the waters of baptism or the prayers on your behalf, you have but to come forward. Let your request be made known while we stand and while we sing.